Here's Janice. It says Vantine. I'm Janice Vantine Auspitz, and I am an alcoholic. And I am so excited to be here. I gotta, I gotta thank a couple of people. First, I want to thank my dear friend Curtis for recommending me to my new dear friend Phil. It's an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank my friends who showed up. I could cry that you guys just popped in. Like literally. Because of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have solid, solid, unbreakable relationships and women that I sponsor. And I'm forever grateful for that. And I want to thank Jim for reading Chapter 5. Thank you, Jim. And I, uh, the 12 Steps. And I want to thank Robert for reading our 12 Traditions. And I'm going to tell you a funny little story. Last night, Phil and I were talking, and he called me Pandas. And I said, do you know my name? Do you know my name? And, and he goes, oh, I'm sorry, Janice. I said, it's okay. Candace can be my stripper name. So I can be Candace. It's all good. Anyways, let's get on this party here. Um, you know, I, I say I want to thank my friends, but actually you're all my, you're all my friends. You're my people. You're my tribe. You're my people. You are all my people. And I would like to see each and every one of you, but there's quite a few pages. So it's such an honor to be here. And my theme is this, and I'll, you'll hear it in my story. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see our experience can benefit others. It's one of my favorite promises. Although I love all the promises, that's my theme. So my sobriety date is May 11th, 1997. My home group is the Pacific Group here in uh, California. I'm sure you've all heard of the Pacific Group. And my sponsor is Pat Yo. And you may know Pat Yo. Pat Yo has 46 years of sobriety and Pat has a sponsor and her sponsor has a sponsor and I have a sponsor and I sponsor and my baby sponsor and I'm forever grateful. Like literally I'm a little teary right now. So I'm just forever grateful. Um, and I have a long talk. So we'll, we'll just go on a little cruise. You know, I was raised in Torrance, California. Um, I'm the middle, mis middle misfit of three kids, and I'll just kind of paint the picture, okay? My, I'm, I'm the middle kid, okay? I have a brother, older brother, younger sister, mom, dad, small family, but I'm going to tell you, um, from a very young age, I remember feeling uncomfortable in my skin. I didn't know what that was. Um, I remember at the age of two, my mom said I was like this brat, such a brat. I was in the garage hiding in a box. And then when I was five, I remember I was in kindergarten and my mom cut my hair and I looked like a boy and they called me James. And I'll never forget in kindergarten, I felt uncomfortable and I cared painfully what people thought of me, like painfully, painfully. I truly believe that I was, um, I don't know, born an alcoholic. I have the alcoholic gene. I don't know, but I had all the ism going at a very young age. I remember like, oh, do you like me? Do you like me? Do you like me? Why don't you like me? What can I do to make you like me? You know, and my head, the committee was already going at a very young age. I'm like, oh, did I say something that was smart enough? Did you like what I said? Do I have anything in my teeth? That is, does my butt look too big? Oh my gosh. And before you, and be, whatever you're saying to me, I'm already thinking what I'm going to say. And by the time I'm saying it, I can't really hear what you said. And that started really early for me, right? Um, you know, I wasn't, I was a chunky kid. I was a chunky kid and I cared very much what people thought of me. And my first chemical from the neck up was sugar. I ate sugar alcoholically. I don't know about anybody else, but I started eating sugar alcoholically. I didn't know I was eating sugar alcoholically. My parents, my parents drank. Um, I would not call them alcoholics, but they drank and they also fought a lot. And I used to think they were fighting about me. It was always about me. Everything was about me. You know, I just thought everything was about me. Um, and I also remember like my first other chemical from the neck up. I'll tell you, I, I, this is me on the natch. I'm very, I'm very energetic. And my mom worked for doctors and she had Dexedrine in the house. And she started giving me Dexedrine at the age of nine. I am truly an alcoholic, but I will tell you, I was helping mom clean the house at the age of nine and 10. And so, and I liked the effect it produced. My parents, they drank. 
They seemed to get along better when they drank. I remember the clickety click of the ice. My dad smoked. I thought it was very glamorous, very glamorous. I couldn't wait to try it. And we're, you know, we're, we, I was raised Catholic and we're Irish, Italian and all those good things. And so we could have a little bit of wine at dinner and I liked it and it had a little bit of beer with salt in it. I don't know what that was, but my mom would put some in. I'm young and I like it. And my brother and sister are like, ew. And I'm like, oh, I like it. I remember I, I started smoking. Like I thought it was cool. I, I, you know, like 10 and 11 years old. And I just wanted to be cool. And I wanted to fit in with everybody. And I'm also the girl. Let me tell you, my parents fought and they used to say, Here's what's happening in the house. Whatever's happening in the house, you go out in the world and you tell everybody everything is fine. I became the fine girl. I don't know about all of you, but I became everything is fine. And they're fighting and whatever's happening and they're throwing pots and pans. And I go out in the world and go, everything is good. We are the perfect family. We have the white picket fence and the dog and everything is good. And, you know, but, but, so, you know, you start living like that kind of double life a little bit. Um, and that, and, and, and I was in fear and I didn't know I was in fear. And so I became a really big people pleaser, huge people pleaser. If you didn't like me, Barbara, I went up to you and said, Barbara, what can I do to make you like me? I'll do anything. And I sold my soul to the devil starting very early like that, you know, that feeling of, I don't really know what's making me tick, but whatever makes you make me tick, that's how I'm going to tick like a chameleon, you know, and, um, but also a lot of things were happening for me, even though I, though I was people pleasing, I had a lot of promise. I was a good little student. I was very athletic. Um, I was very happy until all of a sudden I wasn't, my isms started kicking in, you know, um, at a very young age. I like to say this because it's part of my story. You know, um, I started having these uh, in 11 and 12, I started, you know, eating alcoholically. So I've been an alcoholic from the get go. And that led to a whole bunch of eating problems. But let me tell you something. I am a true alcoholic and the signs were there very early. Now, um, I had those sippy sips very young. And, you know, I remember cold duck and Lancer's wine and Spamante and Bartles and James. But I'll tell you what I really kind of liked was Boone's Farm Tickle Pink. Did anybody drink Boone's Farm Tickle Pink? Oh, it was delicious. And so here's how I am on the match. I already told you how I am on the match. I care what you think about me. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I want to be the most popular. I'm going to be perfect at everything I do. And if, it, if I'm not good enough at it, I'm not going to do it. And I'll tell you what, I take that drink and that drink takes me and I don't feel comfortable in my skin, but all of a sudden I'm all that in a bag of chips and you are lucky to be with me. And alcohol has that effect on me almost immediately. I didn't start drinking every day at the age of 13, 14 and 15, but I, I remember my first brown out. I was about 14, 15. My parents, my mom, she was smart. She let us have a little bit of drinks at the house. She knew I'd go out there and find it myself. So we became kind of the party house. And I remember I was in front of my parents' house on the curb with a dress and everybody around. And I blacked out. My skirt was over my head and everybody was laughing at me. And it was funny. And I was the life of the party. And I was the life of the party for a while until I was the laugh of the party you know, and I was, and, and then it started really early too, like at the age of 16, I gave a boy a hickey and his girlfriend came and told me that I did. I don't even remember doing that. And I sat there and I defended the right to be wrong. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was. So I started having these hot things happening at 17 when I mean 16. And then my parents had a graduation party for me at the age. I was 17 when I graduated. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I like the effect produced by alcohol. So I don't want to eat very much. I like to drink on an empty stomach. I want to get there. I want to get there fast. And it doesn't really matter. I drank a whole bunch of champagne on my high school graduation. Oops, I forgot to show up to my parents' house for my party. Now, come on. So I'm disappointing people already. 
I got sober at the age of 35. I'm here at the age of 17 right now. So here's how it goes. Um, now I had a lot of, a lot of potential. I graduated high school and I went to college. However, I don't know about you guys, but I started getting in the bars early. Um, I always looked older. I always wanted to grow up fast. I always wanted to be older than I was now. You know, we all want to turn back the aging clock, but remember those days. And I started getting into bars early. And what happens for me, I'm in college, but, you know, I also started working at a very young age. You know, I'm going to say this, and I really, truly mean it. You are the smartest, smartest human beings that I know. You're the hardest working human beings that I know. And I love you. And I am a very hard worker, you know? And so I started working really hard at a very young age. And, you know, I remember that first full-time job because, you know, I started college and I went, ah, I just don't want to do this. So I, I wanted to make money. Mm. And so I'm working my first little job. And then I start going to the bars. And I'm going to these bars around, um, about, around my hometown. And I start doing things that allow me to drink more, you know, allow me to drink more. And I got very exposed to a lot of things that allowed me to drink more. And actually, it allowed me to drink more. So I'm getting in the bars and I'm doing that and I'm working full time. And then I start what's happening for me now is boys. You know, I remember when I saw my my first little naked boy in uh, in fifth grade and I had to chase that. I had to chase that. You know, I think I said I'm a large cheating thief and a ho, ho, ho is an alcoholic woman. So at the very young age, I'm like, I got to get me some more of that. I saw that at the age of five and I did. I just chased it and chased it and chased it, you guys. And, you know, remember what I said, no matter how far down the scale, our stories can benefit someone else. So what happens for me is I start having, um, I'll never forget. You know, I started going home with people that I don't know at a very young age, you know, from the bars. And you know what that leads to? Incomprehensible demoraliz demoralization started early for me. I had a boyfriend in, in, in high school, but then something kicked in that I needed a lot of attention. So I'm in the bars and I'm starting to go home with Betty. Your boyfriend looks pretty good. I think I'm going to go home with him. But you see, I'm a blackout drinker. So I'm not really thinking about what's happening. And the next day I have so much remorse and I'm so disgusted and I'm so ashamed. But while it's happening, it doesn't count because I'm in a blackout, you know? And for me, what happened is everything I talk about are my God shots. And I have so many God shots that got me here. So many. And so I'll paint the picture for how I drink. Okay. I'm 21 years old. I drink about, you guys remember the Long Island iced teas? The Long Island iced teas and the kamikazes and the shots of tequila. And like I had mixed drinks until mixed drinks until mixed drinks. The mix just got in the way. But I had like 10 Long Island iced teas. I'm 21 years old and we are partying and I'm drinking kamikazes and shots of orgasms. And I always say I had multiple orgasms and I went right to jail. God shot. God shot. In, in the meantime, what's happening for me is I'm seeing a therapist and I'm lying to her. How much are you drinking? Not, you know, three beers here and there. I'm, my drinking is progressing already. And when I, when I got that drunk driving, let me paint the picture. I'm not a lady. I said it was glamorous and ladylike. I am a pig when I drink. A pig. And there's a there's a male officer and there's a female officer. And I proceed to tell the female officer that I know that no one, please don't get offended by anything I say. This is just my story. And I said, you know, I said to the female officer, I said, I know that you're a lesbian and you're going to rape me. She did not take very well to that. And then the male officer, I thought, you know, this always works for me. I got, I got the groove going on. I offered him a personal breathalyzer and we'll call it a day in the back of the car. Click, click, handcuff, hog tie, go to jail. Oh, and on the way to jail, I am really obnoxious. 
And I say to them, I am not doing that breathalyzer thing. You take me to the hospital because it's an accurate blood test. You guys, it is really accurate. 0.30 was my first drunk driving at the age of 21. My first nudge from the judge, forever grateful. And I remember I went into my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Now, I never want to forget being hogtied in the back of a cop car. However, I went back and did it again and again and again and again. You know, keep coming back. I kept going back. So, but I never want to forget the age of 21. I went to my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I'm in drunk driving school. I'm grateful for drunk driving school. I have a PhD in drunk driving school. Just kidding. Um, and uh, I remember what they said to me. They said, you know, dear, a BAC at point at 3.0 is like three times the limit. And that's not normal drink. And I'm like, yeah, you just don't understand. I can drink a lot. And I was very proud of that, right? But then I went into Alcoholics Anonymous and I thought, I'm just unlucky. I have all the outside stuff. I know how to do the outside stuff. I always did. I was raised by a mother at, up until the age of 90. She wore lipstick to bed because she said, you never know. So we know how to do the outside stuff. I was raised in a home where we knew. Um, however, so what happened, I'll never forget my first alcohol synonymous meeting. And I looked at the differences rather than the similarities, but the seed was planted. And you were talking about alcohol and I was salivating. And guess what I did? I went to AA and I went to drink. I fulfilled all those obligations. I did what I was supposed to do, but now I'm really aware of my drinking and I'm drinking more. You know, I'm drinking more. The seed was planted. I'm in my early 20s and I thought, I was just unlucky. I got through that. So now I'm working and I'm cocktail way, I'm cocktailing and bartending. And you know what happens if anybody's in that industry? We party. We so party. So I'm working during the day and then I'm partying and working as a bartender at night. And I am just, you know, I'm going home with, I don't know, Edna's boyfriend and Lori's boyfriend and Annie's boyfriend and, you know, you know, and things like incomprehensible demoralization. I can talk like this because I don't live like this anymore. And, you know, I wake up pregnant and I wonder how that happens. And furthermore, at one point in my life, I wasn't sure who it might be with. I never want to forget that one drink takes me there. Never, 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 never. I like, you know, nobody wanted to marry me. I used to really I go to weddings and I'll tell you, weddings were really tough for me. Everybody's getting married. Nobody wants to marry me. Um, and uh, I'm in all these weddings and, you know, I need all the attention. So I'm kind of like this girl. I always have to say this for myself, you guys. This is really for me. I do things that are so inappropriate when I drink. I'm, you know, I break dance at weddings in a short dress with no panties. And I literally think that we're all on the dance floor doing the splits. I'm very, very flexible. You need to know that I can do the splits. You need to know that I'm a gymnast. You need to know. I, 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 and pretty soon I stopped getting invited to weddings, you know, and then pretty soon what happens is I get another drunk driving. And so I got a second drunk driving, which is another God shot. It's another God shot. Um, and that time I hit four to five parked cars, you know, and I always used to say I didn't hurt anybody, but I, I hurt everybody, you know, I hurt everybody. Um, and, and I used to say, oh, you know, I never hurt anybody. I have to say I've had three drunk drivings and a whole bunch of drunken publics, you know, drunk on my bike, drunk on the bus. Um, and I, I literally never hurt anyone in my drunk driving, but let me tell you something. I'm forever grateful that I didn't, but I hurt everybody and I crashed every car that I ever owned or that somebody, my parents gave me. I, I just, I'm, you know, I'm just that alcoholic. Um, and what's happening for me at that second drunk driving, which is a God shot for me, that's a whole bunch more Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And it's a whole bunch more 
drunk driving school and they made me sign a contract. And you know what? I signed it and I couldn't do it. I couldn't not drink. I didn't know that I couldn't not drink. And what happened for me, and I like, I really like to talk about this because here I am in therapy and I'm working and I'm drinking more and more and more. And um, I start, you know, after that second drunk driving, it was really highly recommended. At one point in my life, I had a lot of lawyers in my life, a lot of police officers in my life. And, you know, my lawyer said, I think that you should really look at this and really go into a program. So I did. I went into a hospital program, hospitals, institutions, and um, that's Janice. That's what I do. And I was about uh, 26 years old, 27 years old. And I like to talk about this because I'm forever grateful for it. Um, I got into a hospital program and I was exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous. It was like the $40,000 big book, you know, and I'm in this program but I'm exposed to so much help. See, my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, the language of the heart was there, you were there, you all were there, I just wasn't ready. You know, I wasn't ready. But the language of the heart and your open hearts were there. And I don't, I haven't forgotten one person along the lines that has helped me. And so I in this, I'm in this hospital program and I, I told you I was a people pleaser, I want to be perfect. I want to be the best. I want to be the perfect. I want the counselors to love me. I want everybody to think I'm so loving and so, because really deep down at the core, I always knew I actually was a loving person. I really did because I was raised around love, you know? Um, however, so what happens in the hospital program is um, we're going to a lot of meetings. There's a lot of group therapy. I had my own psychiatrist. I had my own therapist come in and see me. And we went to lots of Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And we were reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 and 12. And, and I was exposed to this amazing program of Alcoholics Anonymous. So when I'm in a structured environment, I started to do really well. I never knew I wasn't a structured person. I never knew alcohol. I never knew alcoholism took my structure away from my life. I never knew that, but I always did really well in structure. So what happens for me is while I'm in that structured environment, I'm doing well. My family's happy. Everybody around me's happy. The neighborhood is, is safer. It's good. I'm sober. Um, and I stayed sober for three and a half years, but I will tell you, and I'm forever grateful for this experience is a majority of that time, I was emotionally dry. I was dry. And I'm forever grateful that it took me to the gates of insanity to understand that I, I have a living problem. Drinking is just part of the problem that I have. And I lived it. I was homicidal. I was suicidal. Let me paint a picture of how I live when I'm sober but emotionally and spiritually and mentally and physically, you know, dry without you, my people, my tribe, my brothers, my sisters, a God that is, you know, pretty much me. Um, and, you know, not living by principles of what is so eloquently laid out for each and every one of us, you know, like my first year of sobriety and that sobriety, I, uh, I was doing really well because I was in the program, talking to a sponsor, talking to um, you, my fellows, going to meetings. And then what Janice does is Janice starts doing it her way and I get forgetful. I get forgetful when I'm not around you. I forget that I'm an alcoholic. I forget how bad it is. I forget. However, I'm one of these, I'm a people pleaser. So I'm out there and I'm working. I'm a workaholic too. I think, you know, it's just in me. I'm a workaholic. And so what happens uh, is I start getting away from meetings, but I'm walking around and I'm talking about this book. I'm an, I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous. And I quote things, but I'm not living them, you know, and lying by omission is lying. And what happens for this girl when she's not in with my fellows and a God of my own understanding and regular meetings and steps, steps one through 12. 
um, and living them and applying them in my daily life, I live like this. And so what happens is um, I have this little job and it's not paying me very much. And I'm the office manager and I am very entitled. I own the petty cash. I don't know. I borrowed all of it because I felt that I was entitled. I know that's my alcoholism. I know that today. Um, but how it, how it works is my future brother-in-law, who I've been making amends to ever since, living amends, living amends, formal amends. My future brother-in-law, I meet him at this little jobby poo. And he's just the perfect man for my sister. And I introduce them. And so what happens is one day I got a speeding ticket and I wasn't really speaking to, a, a, you know, um, a sponsor. I wasn't telling anybody. I was so, you know, I was living that double life. I got to look good. You can't really know what's going on. I got the speeding ticket. So I have a warrant out for my arrest with all those other DUIs, right? My two DUIs. They come to my little office and the cops come and they handcuff me and take me away. And while I'm in jail, sober, sober, while I'm in jail, uh-oh, and everybody's around the office going, what's she going to jail for? So, of course, they're checking my whole office out, and all the petty cash is gone. My future brother-in-law had to fire me. Can you imagine what he thought? What am I getting myself into? Mm -hmm. My sister's embarrassed. I mean, I, you know, again, again, again. So... And my, and, I, and my mom has to come bail me out once again in jail. And I'm sober. And I never want to forget that incomprehensible demoralization. You know, and this is still what happens. So that's still in this three and a half years of dry time. I'm going to get sober, I promise. But this is so valuable to me because I know when, you know, I can spot it if someone's, you know, feeling this way or, or, or not, feel, you know, because like, the disease is still kicking it's like that dry time is like still kicking irritable restless and discontent and homicidal and suicidal i can i can i can i can pick up on it i've been able to help a lot of people with it i'm telling you um and i'm so grateful for that so so what happens is um i get another job poo because that job obviously fired me and now i'm working in aerospace and i'm working in rockwell international and um, here's what happens on this job. I met this job for eight years, but I, I started this job sober. And then what happened is, I don't know about you guys, but we drink a lot in aerospace. Like it was fun and I'm sober and I'm thriving on this job. And that is not ego. You guys, I'm a hard worker. So are you, I'm working hard. And what happens is I get far enough away from all of you that I think that at a wedding, three and a half years of sobriety, I can drink. And I'll never forget it like it was yesterday. And I had a, you know, and, and it's just like in the big book, you know, you know, a little milk, a little milk, a little brandy in that milk. I've done it over and over again. And I had a little shot of Grand Marnier and that little shot of Grand Marnier turned into a bottle of vodka about two days later, turned into another drunk driving. Not too long later, I am an alcoholic. There's no, you know, there's no question. I'm grateful that all of these, God had a bigger plan for me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade my story for the world because it's my story, you know? But what happens is while I'm, while I'm on that job, um, I'm working at Rockwell International. And then what happens is I'm like the employee of the, you know, the month and the year. And then I start picking up a drink and then I'm the girl that the unbudsman is watching and that's not good in aerospace and what happens here's what happens they're writing reports about me and i like to steal things i like to steal things out of refrigerators i don't know about you guys but i know what's in your desk jim and curtis and frank and Sherry, I know what's in your desk because I'm kind of snooping around and I'm in, you know, I'm kind of like hung over, but I'm still kind of lit at work. And this is kind of where I'm going to get in 1995 to 1997. That was my last drink. It lasted around the clock for two years. But in 1995, what happened is through a series of write ups in that job, I'm at my desk. And I'm hung over. And I'm actually wearing the same outfit I wore yesterday 
to work the next day. And you know what? Frank, I stole your lunch and I'm eating it at my desk. And you come up to me and there's like 2000 people in this building in aerospace and you come up and everybody's got my number but me they're just trying to get rid of me and you come up to my desk and you say i hope you like my sandwich really loud super loud the whole building can hear and i'm like this is delicious did you make me another one you know the next day i got fired i never want to forget incomprehensible demoralization oh never and from 1995 when i lost that job to 1997 may 11th 1997 tell me what time i shut up phil five up five up okay i don't want to go over um okay and so what happened for me 1995 to 1997 you know how i drank and it got worse it just got worse I'm drinking around the clock pop up vodka. I am doing things that women shouldn't be doing with people she shouldn't they they shouldn't be doing it with. I sold my soul to the devil, and I never want to forget. And I move everywhere. I'm the you know I'm the alcoholic that's all throughout this big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I you know I'm the girl that steals your money and helps you look for it. And you know I am living. No one at the end of my drinking wanted to talk to me except for my cat, my little baby cat. No one. I am a tornado that runs through your life. And I had accumulated all of this wreckage because I never cleaned it up at the very beginning of my life and that dry time. I never cleaned up anything. So I've got all this wreckage. And I don't know about you guys, but while I'm in a blackout, I call central office all the time. And I've been in, a, in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous to a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings. And so there was something about me, you know, no special day different than any other, no worse drunk than anything, but I called central office and oh, in that aerospace job, I have to tell you, they tried to help me and I, got, I tried to get sober three more times in the EAP program. And I had a year here, I had nine months there, I had three months here. If anybody struggled, I, I do wanna first say, let me please welcome anybody who's new because I know a lot of people who got sober their first meeting and I know it can be done. That's just not my story and, and that's okay. Like I said, I'm gonna keep my story, but you never have to drink again one day at a time because I know a lot of people who have stayed sober from their first meeting. And I also wanna welcome anybody who's back or back or back or back because I just kept coming back. At one point in my life, the only place that welcomed me, me was Alcoholics Anonymous. So May 11th, 1997, what happens for me is I got into a recovery home for women. Now, I'm living like an animal. I move everywhere because once you know who I am, I got to go. And I started having to call, I, but I got into a, a sober living home for women. Now, I don't have any friends. If you know me, you tell me to go away. The lower companions are telling me to go away. Just go away. And I got into the House of Hope in San Pedro, and it was once again a structured environment. It was the last house on the block for me, and I'm forever grateful. And it wasn't easy, and I'm forever grateful for that. You know, something inside of me knew that intuitively there was an inch of hope that I had never given Alcoholics Anonymous a full both feet in. I never had. There were parts of my time in my life that I had, but I'd never done it, my favorite word, is consistently. So May 11th, here's what happens for me. As I'm in this house of hope in San Pedro, I had to learn, I was living like an animal. I had to learn my living skills. I know what it's like to lose every single moral fiber of integrity. And I had to learn all over again to be reprogrammed. I'm forever grateful. And things like this, I had to learn how to clean again, because I'm a pig. I had to learn how to do laundry again and remember that there's somebody behind me. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm living in my apartments and I start drinking, I start my laundry. And then by the time the cycle's over, I'm in a blackout and I leave all my stuff everywhere. 
selfish, self-centered, self-thinking alcoholic. I had to learn how to do that over again. And you know what we started to do is we started to take the actions. And we, we you know, and, and I had to do the white, the white glove test. I'd clean the whole house. And they would tell me it's not clean enough. And I had to learn how to shut up and not tell them what I thought. Because it was the last house on the block for this alcoholic. You know, and my sponsor, you could not be in this program without a sponsor. So I had a sponsor. Her name was Molly. I've had nothing but amazing sponsorship all throughout my life. And, and Molly was my first sponsor in this sobriety. And Molly picked me up in San Pedro, California. And she had been in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous too. And she had all kinds of similarities like me. And she picked me up when we could get a pass. Oh, and you know, and I love being humbled. We would pick up trash in our house, a whole t-shirts in San Pedro. And I'm like, what if somebody sees me? Like, who the heck cares? You know how all those little things had to be crushed and picking up trash and being of service. And she starts taking me. We we're going to all these meetings. And if you didn't get along with anybody in the house, you were kicked out. So I had to learn how, you know, to be of service. And I remember very early on to the, the women would say, you know what? They'd say, you know what? Just be of service to each other. Learn how to be of service. Stop being so selfish. And my sponsor would say, go be of service to the house. So I started doing that, started making coffee and I started doing things for the girls. And, and um, I never realized that I'd never really been of service for so long, you know, without expecting anything in return. So then my sponsor, she started picking me up and I'm doing all of these meetings in San Pedro. And she told me, she said, honey, you don't have a relationship. You are not getting one in your first year because the Pacific group was where she started taking me. And I remember all the girls in the Pacific group said, that'd be a good group for you. That'd be a good group for you. And I'm like, why, why, you know, and you know what? I'm forever grateful that my first sponsor started taking me to the Pacific group. And she told me, she said, look, none of these men are going to want anything you have. The men stick with the men and men and the women stick with the women. And I'm like, mm, you sure? You sure? She was right. She was so right. And this alcoholic needed that. This alcoholic needed that. Remember, the hand of Alcoholics Anonymous has always been there for me. But when the light switch turns on, ding, 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 whatever it takes. And so we go to meetings in the Pacific group. And I remember they scared me to death. They were very structured. And, you know, I like to go to meetings where we're chanting and we're talking and the men are looking at the women and the women are looking at the men. And you know what? There was something very serious about the Pacific group and it was an attraction, but it scared me. I didn't turn myself into the Pacific group until I had over a year of sobriety. And I'll tell you why. Here's what happened for me. I lied to my sponsor because, you know, she said no dating and I was sneaking around and I got involved with one of the beacon boys around the block and we were doing the steps but we were not doing the steps honey we were down in San Pedro Ports of Call doing each other on the steps and I never want to forget incomprehensible demoralization sober again and I'm on that trudging road where I'm gonna go you know there's no friendly direction we stood at the turning point we asked his protection and care with complete abandon and here's what happened for me Although my sponsor fired me for lying to her, something, I, my father was diagnosed with a horrific cancer, you know, and in 1995, that did not get me sober. 1996, it didn't get me sober. 1997, and I'll tell you, I am forever grateful that even though I wasn't working an awesome, perfect program, I was sober and I wanted to be sober. And I got to spend my, my, my father's, my father passed away my first 10 months of sobriety. And I want you to know, I am forever grateful because I wasn't allowed in my house, my parents' house, I wasn't allowed. Um, but as long as I was sober, I could be in my parents' house. And I got to take care of my dad a little bit with my mom. My dad was dying for three years. And I'll never forget, he said, honey, my, my cancer's not killing me, you are. And so what I told my dad, and I got to be there, I'm going to tell you, if I wasn't sober, I would have made it about me. And I know it. 
And I got to be there and I got to be with my dad in moments before he went into a coma. And I, I promised my dad, I said, daddy, you know, I had been trying to get sober for everybody. And they told me I have to do it for me, but you are my backup plan. I don't care why we come to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I promised him, I promised him. And I've been keeping my promise one day at a time, but I promised him and I came here until I wanted to be here until I can't wait to be here. And I'll tell you a few little nuggets in five minutes. I think I have five minutes. Yeah, five minutes, Phil? Yeah, okay. Yes, I don't know if you could see me or not. Okay. I can. Thank you, dear. And um, at that point, when I lost my dad, I turned myself into the place that I knew I needed, and that was the Pacific Group. I got me a sponsor, and I started doing everything my sponsor told me to do. Um, and I started, here's some of the things that I started to learn by a sponsor i was intimidated by my sponsor and she said you're going to call me every day at the same time i thought what a tall order but i whether i was really wanting to do this i was willing to do anything and that's so why i started calling my sponsor every day she goes you're going to go to every meeting that the pacific group has and you're going to go to every event and you're going to get commitments at all of your meetings and you're going to get to your commitments early and you're going to stay late and you're going to go do coffee and you're going to go do meals and you're going to call you're going to call me at the first at the first in the morning same time don't be late if you're late i might hang up on you and i learned very early from my sponsor to be of maximum service and it doesn't matter how i feel just take the actions the feelings will follow to this day that is one of the, the most key things i've ever heard take the actions the feelings will follow i can't act my way into better thinking but i can I can, I, can, I can act my way into better thinking, but I cannot think my way into better acting. What a concept. That is like so brilliant. I, I don't know about you guys. I sit there and I'm, I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking about it. Tomorrow I'll start. Nope. Take the actions. The feelings will follow. Take the actions. The feelings will follow. It's taken time for those feelings to follow. But I still know today when I don't want to do something, I learned it from the very beginning of my sobriety and I've been consistent in it. And I teach the women that I sponsor this or, or like they, they learn it too on their own. But it's it's like it's the most brilliant thing I've, thing I've heard. Take the actions. The feelings will follow. And, you know, act better than I feel to, what does that mean? Call my sponsor, tell her what's going on. And then, she, you know, in my home group, we call like three and four or three other women. And she goes, you're calling six other women. And that's where I started finding my friends. And she go, and you know, my head is busy. So I'm calling you and I'm going, Sherry, I'm calling you. What's going on? I just want to talk about you. I just want to talk about you and try to remember one thing you say, and I'll see you at the meeting tonight. And, you know, maybe a couple of days later, we'll start talking. I started finding friends. And I started working my steps with my sponsor, not alone, not the way I think they need to be worked, um, one through 12. And I started taking the actions, the feelings will follow. I was a little twisted on God. And, you know, she said, just get on your hands and knees in the morning and thank God for another day clean and sober and thank God at the end of the day and review your day and thank God, just thank God. And I started taking those actions. The feelings started to follow with step work, step one, step two, step three. Oh my God, they're brilliantly, I've read them. I thought I had done them, but I've really done it half measures and I have not done half measures, nor do I ever wish to do half measures, but I have this experience that has been able to benefit others. And I'm forever grateful for that. You know, I'm forever grateful that I got the dry TikToker brain that I can spot it. I can spot it because I lived it. And I know I get this twist. If I need to call more alcoholics, or I need to do more in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, maximum service, maximum service. And gosh, I have two minutes to tell you, to tell you, there is so much going on in my life, you know, that I've learned here. Being of maximum service is Oh, it's easy in Alcoholics Anonymous. If I'm not doing it here, then I sure as bet am not doing it out in the world. And so whatever I was doing here, I've learned here through great sponsorship, amazing sponsorship, amazing girlfriends, guy friends, 
old timers, newcomers, putting my hand out. I always give my phone number out, sponsoring other women. I guarantee you that is the joy of my life and my friends and my sisters and my brothers. One alcoholic talking to another. I've had a bazillion conversations I have not ever forgotten. Maximum service, maximum living amends, 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 amends. I made them all with a sponsor. And living amends, forever. They're forever. I take care of my 92-year-old mother. I live with her. Um, my husband, I got married. I didn't break dance at my wedding. <laughs> and um, my husband and I are both in Alcoholics Anonymous. And we get to be of maximum service in all of our affairs. I learned it through you. I learned how to suit up and show up. My family, I told you about my brother-in-law and my sister. My sister, who used to come to my houses and find me sprawled out naked, bruised from head to toe. The house is a mess. She's my bestie. I love her. Every vacation, pretty much, has been to visit her. My sister could not have children, so she adopted from Russia, and her son had a, had a biological mother like me, and he has fetal alcohol syndrome, and we love him, but he is really, 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 really got a lot of problems, and my sister and brother-in-law, they trust me with him, me. Can you believe that? alcohol and my mother my mother and i had a, a love hate relationship and my mom asked myself and my husband to move in to the home that i'm in that i grew up in and we get to be a maximum service to my mom and you know what i can't wait to be of maximum service around the clock to alcoholics anonymous or you know or my friends at work or i had a call today um from a friend who's really really having a hard time and I have experience with the problem. So, you know, as I said, my theme is no matter how far down the scale we have gone, oh, my experience, somehow, some way, no matter how good, bad, ugly, or indifferent can benefit others and help someone. And that's my goal in life is to help someone. Um, I love you. And I went over two minutes and I'm going to shut up again. Phil, thank you for having me. Um, Curtis, thank you. I love you. I love you all, and I hope you have a wonderful night. And let's just keep on coming back. It works if you work it. Thanks, you guys. I love you.